Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Team Impri, I, Ritika Gupta, Assistant Director at Impri, welcomes you to Impri Web Policy Talk and wishes you a very happy, healthy, and safe New Year. We at Impri contributes to debate and deliberations for action-based solutions to host a strategic issues. We are committed to democracy, mobilization, and community building. With this, I hand over the stage to Dr. Simi Mehta. Ma'am, over to you. My name is Simi. Thank you, Ritika, for uh, this introduction. And um, it is my pleasure and my absolute honor to uh, have all of you distinguished panelists this evening. Um, this is such a wonderful uh, time of the year to kickstart uh, the new year on such a wonderful topic to reflect upon, lead, leaving the shadow of pain responses to trauma healing amid the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, uh, this is um, a very, this is a topic that that is very close to us at IMPRI, uh, the Gender Studies uh, uh, Center. And uh, I uh, welcome all of you. I wish you a very happy and safe New Year. And I now invite uh, Ms. Anshula, uh, Assistant Director at IMPRI, to take over. Thank you. Um. Good evening, everyone, and a very happy new year to you all. Uh, I'm Anshala Mehta, Assistant Director at IMPRI, and um, I welcome you all to this special lecture uh, organized by the Gender Impact Study Center at IMPRI. Uh, we have with us uh, today Professor Doris Gray uh, delivering her lecture on uh, leaving the shadow of pain, responses to trauma, healing amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we are grateful to have her uh, with us, and it's my privilege to introduce her to you all. Uh, Professor Doris H. Gray directed the Hillary Clinton Center for Women's Empowerment at al Akhawain University in Ifran, Morocco, from 2013 to 2019. Before that, she taught at Florida State University in Tallahassee, Florida, USA. Uh, prior to becoming an academic, Dr. Gray was a journalist and foreign correspondent in South and East Africa. She is now honorary professor at Roskilde University in Denmark. Uh, her books and publications include Leaving the Shadow of Pain, a cross-cultural exploration of truth, trauma, reconciliation, and healing, 2020. Who Hears My Voice Today? Indirect Women Victims in Tunisia, uh, 2018. Women and Social Change in North Africa, What Counts as Revolutionary? Uh, edited with Nadia Sonneveld. Uh, in 2018, Beyond Islamism and Feminism, Gender and Equality in North Africa, 2014, and Muslim Women on the Move, Women in Morocco and France Speak Out in 2008. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gray, for joining us today. Uh, we are so pleased to have you. Uh, we also have with us uh, Professor Govind Kelkar, who is the chair for today's session. She is chairperson of the Gender Impact Studies Center at IMPRI and also executive director of the Gender Center for Research and Innovation. Uh, so with that, it's over to you, Professor Kielker, to make your initial remarks and then on to Professor Gray's presentation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Anshala, so much. Um, welcome, very welcome, Professor Gray, Doris Gray. And your eminence in the field speaks for itself. I, uh, it talks about your achievement. It talks your uh, talks about your long engagement with feminist struggles, gender and development debates, and the subject of pain and resistance, uh, or rather resilience, in the context of COVID. I mean, at uh, I also heard you earlier saying that we needed a paradigm shift, and we really need need so a paradigm shift in dealing with the responses and building our resilience and building our hopes to deal with the crisis, which is not yet over. So with these few words, I we very much welcome you in this forum and we look forward to hearing you uh, and take over. Please, Professor Doris Gray. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Happy New Year to everybody. I hope it will be a sane and certainly more healthy year for us, for all of us. I think it's one of the very few times in my life where the whole world is wishing for the same thing. So maybe that is a good thing that we all focus our good wishes in a very similar direction. 
Um, I also want to thank uh, Professor Kumar for inviting me to give this talk and to my friend and colleague Smita Kumar, who uh, encouraged me on the path to engaging with heuristic research. Um, the title of this talk comes from my latest book, Leaving the Shadow of Pain. And this book is a little bit of a departure from all my previous books in that it also narrates part of my personal life story, which I had never done before. And since I've also never talked about my personal life in public, I will have to rely a little bit on my notes. Usually I talk uh, without notes, but I'm a little nervous um, about talking about such personal things that I um, will rely a little bit on my notes. The book deals with a number of issues in uh, my own uh, childhood in Germany, um, my research in Tunisia with uh, victims of uh, torture under the previous dictatorial regimes, and then some of my own uh, life journey in Morocco. But today I will only focus on very limited aspects of the book because otherwise it is too broad. So the question I start with is, why do we do what we do? How do we connect our rather abstract scholarly inquiry to our life? And why is this important? I don't presume that my life story is interesting to anyone other than my family or myself. But sometimes our personal lives are connected to larger issues and we witness larger historical events and we can draw life lessons from the connection between our own personal fate and the lar larger societal or political issues. I think it's also instructive to look at our personal life story to understand the trajectory of our scholarly inquiries. And I'd like to start with a little anecdote that is not connected to myself, but the German chancellor, Angela Merkel, who is a physicist, was recently asked about her life story. And she responded by saying, had I not grown up in communist East Germany, I would not have become a physicist. But because the system was so unreliable and the system felt so profoundly untrue, I wanted to study something that was true and where the facts were immutable, and that was physics. So even somebody who goes into the natural sciences, the hard sciences, not the social sciences, there usually is a life story that propels them on this path. So it is in this spirit that I give this talk today. For much of my academic career, I worked on women's rights issues in North Africa. Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia. Even before when I worked as a journalist, I always tried to explore issues of justice, always in far off lands. In South Africa during the apartheid regime and then for 10 years in Kenya. While based in Nairobi, I reported on famines in Ethiopia, the civil war in Uganda, the genocide in Rwanda, etc looking at my professional career two things became clear one i was drawn to explore realities that are geographically culturally and linguistically removed from my own and two, second i have been most interested in reporting and later analyzing either as a journalist or as a scholar how larger political or natural crises affect individuals. My best stories as a journalist were those that described the life of people in a refugee camp or of warriors in a civil war. As a scholar, my most intense interest has been on victims of the dictatorial regime in Tunisia and more specifically on women and truth telling in the wake of the Arab uprisings. So one of the themes that has propelled my professional endeavors 
is the theme of truth. During my years as a foreign correspondent covering 22 African countries, I frequently had to uh, report on corrupt regimes and interview corrupt authoritarian leaders. But my focus was not how much corruption affects the growth of a healthy economy, which it certainly does. But what does it mean for citizens if they cannot trust their governments? What does it do to individuals when they know that their leaders willfully deceive them for personal gain for themselves, for their families, their ethnic or religious community? When leadership is deceitful, this becomes the model for society. Even when individuals know the difference between right and wrong or truth and lie, there is an ap atmosphere of deception and that deception is okay. A pervasive sense of mistrust corrodes the harmonious living together and eventually turns neighbors against each other. If this is true for leaders and citizens, how much more is this true for the smaller unit, such as the family? My preoccupation with truth telling or the absence of it, surprise, surprise, comes from my own family. I grew up in Germany. There always was an air of secrecy in our home. On my father's side, we, there were no grandparents, no aunts, no uncles, no cousins, no one. My father seemed to come out of nowhere and was connected to no one other than the family he and my mother created. What is more, my father's background was a taboo subject in our home. We children knew early on that it was better not to ask. He gave us this stare that condemned us to living hell if we dared to touch on the topic of his family. So my sister and I spun our own stories. One was that we thought our dad might be the child of a wandering circus and was dropped off at one of the performance sites. Another was that he may have been the, the son of a sex worker and because my father was a good Catholic, would not admit to such shameful beginnings. My father was a kind man who detested violence in any form towards anyone or anything. But he was often cruel to us children. He, he would put us through strenuous survival trainings for example, and there's many more like this. When we would vacation in the Alps, in the mountains, ostentatiously learning how to ski, he made us take the lift. And at the end of the lift, instead of skiing downhill, he had us put the skis on our shoulders, on our little shoulders and trek up the mountain, further into the mountain. When we would fall down and lie exhausted, cold in the snow, he would beat us with ski poles and tell us that we needed to march on across the mountains. My mother, who was by today's standard an accomplished feminist and a businesswoman in her own right, that who never shied away from an argument with my father. On these occasions, however, she watched in silence as our father drove us relentlessly across the snow-capped mountains. So there was this gentle man who was merciless towards his daughters. He was a father who demanded that we were truthful in all our relationships with people. But for himself, he reserved the right to shroud his life in secrecy. This secrecy kept him distant from us 
I never felt that I could touch my dad, not his body and not his soul. After yet another heart attack and the third time he had fallen into a coma, a coma that doctors predicted he would not survive, he was finally allowed to return home. Suddenly, under all the Catholic icons that adorned his bedroom, my parents were firm believers in separate bedrooms and their marriage lasted 56 years. So in his bedroom, all of a sudden, there appeared black and white pictures of a man and a woman. My dad was in his seventies back then. So I asked him, who are these people? And with the most nonchalant way, he said, why, my parents, of course. A day passed before I mustered the courage to ask, so Papa, who are your parents? He gave me their names and then the stare. No further questions allowed. I'll focus a little bit on the father, my grandfather's uh, story not my grandmother's story. So Sally Berberish was the grandfather I never knew. Sally, being short for Salomon, of course pointed into one obvious conclusion. His father was Jewish. Since my dad would say no more, I started my own research. And this research eventually led me to, to the archives of Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial site in Jerusalem. And there it was, names, places of birth, location of deportation, final destination, death in Auschwitz. I did not know what to do with this bombshell. Another day passed, I had to return to the United States where I lived and worked at the time I dared to open the door to truth just one more time and said, Papa, what happened to your family? His response was astounding. Yes, they were Jewish. They went to America, he said, during the Nazi regime. They escaped the atrocities of the Third Reich and lived a good life in the United States but had left him behind. I said as gently as I could, no, Papa, they did not abandon you. They did not go to America. They all perished in Auschwitz. You are the only survivor. My dad turned as white as a sheet and asked that we leave him alone. He was at this point old and sick, so I knew I did not have much time, if ever I was to find out who my dad really was. In bits and pieces, he revealed how he had survived by crisscrossing Germany, hiding here and there. He was a teenager. He was kicked out of school on account of being Jewish and he was penniless. He did not have money to immigrate. He was on the run for years, always afraid of being betrayed, being found out. He struggled against the most formidable odds to survive as a Jew inside Nazi Germany. The truth, his relentless survivor trainings aimed at equipping us children with the tools to survive should anti-Semitism rise again. And he had no doubt that it would. His cruelty to us children came from a place of love and compassion. But because of his secrecy, because we did not know the truth, we perceived our dad as distant, overly harsh and a little crazy. Not telling the truth about himself made perfect sense to him and to my mother who knew all along. So the question is, can there be a balance between the one who feels they need to keep a secret 
and the one who feels they have a right to know. With all that I know about my dad today, I think there could have been a way for him to lift his secret just enough for us to understand why he did what he did. It, not, it does not have to be all or nothing. However, the price for not telling the truth is high. It hurts the people you love. Not telling the truth <clears throat> hurts the one who is keeping a secret too. It distorts their mind. It twists their sense of reality. One big secret leads to many little secrets. Secrecy also keeps them from loving freely and being loved freely. What is more, the hidden pain gets passed from one generation to another. The pain of trauma is multi-generational. Not knowing the truth about my father instilled in me a sense of never feeling at ease in this world. Because of the life-threatening persecution he experienced, he inculcated me to not trust anyone, especially not anyone in authority, and to be suspicious of rules. And that, in Germany, of all places, where there is a rule for everything and orderliness is next to godliness. So now a long arch to another time and another continent, Tunisia in North Africa. The women in Tunisia who were persecuted, tortured and raped during the dictatorial regime that was overthrown in 2011 Though I do not share the same culture, the same language or religion with these women, there is something they knew about me and something I know about them. Secrets are damaging and the truth can be dangerous. Many victims of mass atrocities do not want to come forth with the truth about what happened to them. They have rebuilt their lives as best they could. Women who were sexually violated don't want their husbands to know what happened to them. Especially, they want to protect their children. So they keep their suffering to themselves. This is particularly true in Tunisia, a Muslim majority country where the honor of the family rests in the sexual virtue the perceived sexual virtue of a woman. Having been sexually violated brings shame onto the entire family. I have encouraged these survivors repeatedly to come forward with their stories, but I do understand why some of them do not want to take that risk. What I have learned though is that healing cannot occur in the absence of truth. Neither can forgiveness or reconciliation. But I've also learned that it is possible to know the truth without knowing every detail. I don't know how a child can make a parent feel comfortable about coming forward with the truth. I'm not sure what exactly a state can do to make victims feel assured about their safety if they come forward with the truth about mass atrocities. Even if we understand why some may choose to keep a big secret, we also need to acknowledge that they have a right to come forward or not. Their personal assessment of the risk involved in coming forward is highly subjective, but it has to be taken seriously. I have also learned that when someone 
does reveal a few facts. This is generally only the tip of the iceberg. As a listener and as a researcher, one should not assume that what one is told is all there is to a story. This leads me again to the women in Tunisia who were persecuted not because they themselves openly opposed the dictatorial regimes, but because they were related to a prisoner of conscience. How can they come forward with the truth even after regime change when the state had so dismally failed to protect them and had so overtly betrayed them? When I conducted interviews with these women and they would tell me their stories of torture, it happened several times that they would reach out, grab my hand and say, are you one of us? Of course, I had never spoken to them about my past. I don't talk about my personal life uh, story when I'm uh, in research mode, but the point is, they seem to sense some kind of kinship, meaning the truth can be known in the absence of facts. It is difficult to heal under the best of circumstances. That is having a supportive family, friends, access to good medical care, counseling, a justice system, etc. In the absence of this, what is the recourse victims have? When the state fails to protect, when the police fails to do their job, when the judicial system sides with the powerful and not with the law, when cultural norms privilege one population group over another, how can people heal? I've not uh, conducted research in India, so I cannot speak to any situation in India. However, I would say that there are some parallels to both my background in Tunisia and my research in uh, my background in Germany and my research in Tunisia. Anytime there is a state of war or a state of emergency, whether it is Nazi Germany, dictator dictatorship in Tunisia, or now worldwide, Due, the, due to the corona crisis. In those types of situation, national security becomes paramount at the price of tolerating individual abuse. Governments and societies in general are so focused or overwhelmed with dealing with the national larger issues that the fate of individual victims becomes subsumed under the managing the larger crisis. And victims again fall silent. More specifically, the fate of individuals, vulnerable individuals, very often women, is again deprioritized. A system in crisis, COVID or otherwise, allows for cover-ups because the individual trauma all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, is again not as important as the overall national directive. So to conclude, truth and healing, what I believe would be necessary for individuals to heal is the following. Number one, Keeping a big secret hurts the one one wants to protect the most. There needs to be an, uh, a space of assurance in which truth can be really, uh, revealed. Second, when a survivor comes forward with some facts, this is usually only the tip of the iceberg and the real crisis rests underneath unrevealed, which leads to the third point. Careful listening from one human 
to another or researcher subject is imperative in validating that the story that is told is important. It is worth being told and it is worth being listened to. It affirms the speaker's life story. And number four, remorse. Someone in position of authority needs to acknowledge the harm done. Someone in a position of authority needs to say, this should not ever have happened to you. And we are sorry. It costs nothing to offer an apology. And I'm fully aware that this is not a tangible restitution, which is also, of course, necessary. But publicly recognizing a wrong and apologizing for a wrong is so important for an individual, for an individual to hear and for allowing themselves to step forward and affirm that they have a right to heal. It takes the trauma victim out of their isolation. It also allows a trauma victim to shed their sense of shame and guilt. Most trauma victims internalize their trauma to the point that they believe at some point or another, they caused what has befallen them. Trauma, an apology allows trauma victims to affirm their self-worth and that they are valued members of the community. For any country to move forward, as a whole, and especially a democratic, transparent society, you need healthy individuals. That's all I want to say today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Gray. And uh, Govind, ma'am, would you like to? Say anything? Go in, ma'am. You're muted. Oh, you're muted. Uh, video also. Yeah. I, I said you touched our raw nerve at this time when the farmers' movement is going on and how we are traumatized, not by only pandemic, but also the complexity of the state and not listening to the farmers in this kind of cold and chaos in the country. So we will come back to that later. Let's hear from other panelists. Professor uh, Rukmini Bhuya Nair, I think, uh, uh, would you like to share your thoughts with us? Yes, but uh, let us also introduce Rukmini, ma'am. Yes, don't... please, please. Yeah. Um... Hmm. Professor Rukmini Bhayanayar is Professor of Linguistics and English at the Indian, Indian Institute of Technology, IIT Delhi. Her research interests are in the fields of cognitive linguistics, pragmatics, narrative, English studies, philosophy of language, technocultures, literary and post-colonial theory, gender and creative writing. Yes, ma'am, please go on. <laughs> okay. So thanks for that introduction. I want to thank our speaker um, for a very poignant and perceptive account of uh, what uh, uh, tra uh, tragedy as well as trauma mean. Uh, but uh, since I'm not familiar with, um, with this work, and I'm ashamed to say this, uh, I know much of this is in North Africa, and uh, we've been told about the background, but I will make comments from my own perspective as a linguist, as, 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 as somebody who is interested in 
these areas of truth and lies and uh, deception and also affect, but I will ask it from, ask my questions or just comment from a perspective which may be different from that of an activist or a social worker. I guess my um, remarks would be in three areas. The first one is the area of affect. The second one is the area of language. Uh, and the third one is uh, uh, essentially politics and the relationship between the individual's narrative and the state narrative and the kind of power relations which obtain between them. So at the beginning of uh, Professor Gray's talk, she asked this question, why do we do what we do? But it was closely connected in her talk with another question to my mind, which was the question of origins. Where do we come from? And that's where she talked about her Jewish father and uh, as a Holocaust survivor and the fact that he, she as a child could, did not have an answer to this very important question, where did my family come from? Where did my father come from? Now this question of origins is I think central to, to, to our own stories and how we tell them. So let me begin with my own experience in the field. When I was a PhD student, I worked on narratives of disaster, disaster narratives. And what I was working in was, a, was um, a, you know, a flood narratives, because as you know, in a flood, everything gets wiped away. And people have to rebuild their own universe. So how do they do this? And uh, how do they tell us where they came from? So I, my first submission would be that trauma can be involved something like a Holocaust, some extremely traumatic man-made event, but it can also involve, uh, uh, you know, so yeah, natural kind events like disasters. The, I, the point I wish to stress is that the reaction of a distant state can be exactly the same, whether it is, uh, whether it is uh, a, a natural kind disaster or a man-made disaster, because state, the state asks you for your stories of compensation, for verification, and for all these procedural things when people are suffering great trauma and not necessarily secret trauma, but trauma that is nevertheless invisible because the state does not see it as trauma. They see it as a transactional relationship between the state and the people who are almost always the poorest struck, str who are struck by disaster. So my first question would be, how do we look at uh, the narratives of people in these situations? How do we empower them? Because um, what I found is that since this is a gender group, what I found in my research is that women's strategies are very different from men's strategies. And I took down the linguistic features. What I found is women had many more exclamatives. They had many, many more joint tellings. They uh, witnessed each other's uh, stories of disaster, whereas the male narratives were extremely, uh, there was one voice and it was removed from other voices. So one suggestion I would have is if we are looking at narratives of trauma and disaster, A, there is not always a secret uh, concealed, but there is some, uh, population is invisibilized and that's like a secret history of the state. The second thing I would say is that when you look at strategies women, women's have, women have for truth telling, it can involve joint tellings, it can involve supportive behaviors in a way that's not always available to 
males because of patriarchy, and that we should therefore look at women's narratives uh, in terms of their particular linguistic features. The other thing that I would like to say with regard to affect is that when I was doing this work, I was also reading Maurice Blanchot, and he talked, he has documented narratives of trauma and written about the Nazi regime. And one um, sentence when it came in his work, which struck me very much, was he said, it was an imperative sentence. It said, learn to think with pain. So, and I think that a lot of uh, us do not know how to think with pain. And often going into the field, listening to individual voices and what, how they witness each other's sayings may be about learning to think with pain for which societies do not really have and political systems do not have the resources to do. And this is the point to do with, for, for those who research these areas, to do with qualitative research versus quantitative research. So the state usually has lots and lots of statistics on who was affected, where they were affected, where the disaster originated, where it ended. But the state that has not collected oral narratives, has not collected detailed qualitative individual accounts. And I believe that this is one area where uh, the sort of research which Professor Gray has uh, talked about um, comes from. So, so, so you know, it, uh, is relevant. So I think we do need more methodological shifts as in order to have a paradigm shift in how we investigate trauma in a society. And my own research has taught me this. Um, the, the, as far as language is concerned, I have a lot to say, but let me restrict myself to one area. And that is, I myself am interested in language breakdown, where language breaks down. So in situations of extreme grief, for example, language breaks down. We may put our arms around somebody, but we may not have the words for it. Similarly, uh, when we come across other cultures, uh, uh, we, uh, we may have linguistic barriers which prevent us from understanding affect. So another set of methodologies, another set of investigations would consider how we deal with systems of potential and actual language breakdowns. And this happens in cases of affect and otherwise uh, or in many, many other situations as well. So healing is not only, in, to my mind, it may be about truth telling, but it is also about how we deal with what happens in our minds when we have trauma and disaster. And therefore, I believe this is an interdisciplinary field, trauma research, which will involve psychologists, which will involve linguists, which will involve journalists and various other people. So I think that um, uh, a second area to look at would be the, uh, the, the, the relationship between um, the, um, the affect, the cognitive affect, and how we express that affect, sometimes we do not have the words to let it out. So how do we let it out? How do we train researchers to understand these modes of um, uh, responsibility to the other? I think that's another area of research. Um, one of the things that has been found is that in um, Situations of global trauma, such as um, the COVID crisis now, and it, during 9-11, for example, in America, people wrote more poetry. They wrote more stories. They sent them to radio stations. So why was this? It was partly because poetry, um, Literature is the language of crisis. So I think we need to pay attention to literary modes as well of sharing 
our experiences, then that's a very common oral in the oral traditions. And finally, to end with India, because my experience is with India, we have found rising graphs through an alarming number of studies. For example, the WHO, uh, WHO study, let me just quote, examples over the past decade. Who, the OHU study said Indians were the most de depressed people in the world, which is unusual because mostly depression rates are higher in advanced countries. But in India, we have high rates of depression, around 30%. The, so that's the WHO survey. The Reuters survey also in 2011 found that Indian women said that they were the most stressed in the world. Uh, the Lancet study in 2012 said that, um, you know, that uh, there was a childbirth was going to be supplanted by suicides among women as the most uh, important cause of death in a certain population. So over and over again, we are finding that a complex of things, disasters, trauma, uh, stress, all these dimly understood terms are coming together in a population like India, even when there isn't an overt and cruel regime. So the question really is, with all these facts before us, these truths before us, how does a normal, ordinary citizen uh, uh, come coordinate with uh, investigators, researchers, writers, poets to understand these, ter these terrifying statistics? So there are secrets and there is Possibly truth and reconciliation is not the simple answer, but I do think that Professor Ray's talk has raised important questions about uh, how we go about our understanding of this cluster of terms from disaster to, uh, to um, you know, to uh, things like important accounts of the self. So I think there are a host of questions. This is off the top of my head because I hadn't read the paper, but uh, they, it does tie in with lots of research um, questions that we have right on the ground in this country, in this polity. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, 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 Professor Nair, Rukmini ma'am, for sharing the Indian perspective as, as well. And, uh, uh, since you are the expert, so we really thought to have you and share with all of us. Uh, Professor Gray, would you like to respond now or shall we go also to our next uh, discussant, as you suggest, ma'am? Um, it may be better for everybody to respond, sure. I think, because probably people are eager to deliver, deliver their responses and questions. And I took notes, so I can then go through the questions after uh, we've heard from everyone. Yes, so Anshula, why don't you invite Nan Yes, we can go to Nandi ma'am first, yes. Anshula? Hello? Yes, go on. Yes, our next discussant is Dr. Nandini Murli. She is an author, independent researcher and a gender and communications professional. Her areas of professional interest include gender-based violence, masculinities, LGBTQIA issues, mental health, and trauma literacy and education. She is also the director of Speak, uh, an initiative based in Madurai, set up to change conversations on suicide and promote mental health. Um, Ma'am, over to you. Thank you, Anshula. Uh, before I begin, uh, Professor Gray, thank you so much for that very profoundly moving and uh, straight from the heart uh, sharing. Uh, as I was listening to you, I just found that something very interesting was happening within me. Uh, like you, I've also, I have a huge interest in uh, lived experience narratives. And uh, when you were sharing your story, uh, your story, what Im I was immediately reminded of uh, the, the the recent trauma I had to I I underwent in my life, 
the reason I'm sharing it here is that the motifs of secrecy, silence, and shame is something so overwhelming, and I resonated uh, with that. But before I begin, I was also, when I was listening to you, I was also reminded of someone saying that the universe is made of stories, uh, not atoms. And uh, lived experience narratives, loss narratives, trauma narratives is something which I've always been very, very interested. But recently, since I've had this lived experience, it's given me uh, perspectives which I didn't have earlier. So when I was listening to you and when you, uh, you shared that in your work with the women in North Africa, they sort of uh, really bonded with you instantly without knowing your story. I can't, I can't tell you that how often I experience that uh, because I feel there is a strange fellowship uh, between those who are bonded by pain. To give you a little bit of a context so that it makes it a very clear as to where I'm coming from and why the enormous resonance with your narrative is that I've been impacted by suicide loss. I lost my husband recently to suicide. And I think the way, meaning making, uh, your question, why do we do what we do? And one of the ways I began to make meaning out of this devastation was uh, through writing because uh, writing is something which comes naturally to me I enjoy I enjoy the process and therefore writing about what I was going through and uh, suicide uh, I think anywhere across the world I think if there is one great leveler this has to be it because I think the uh, stigma the shame the secrecy and silence is pretty similar wherever and therefore, when you said um, uh, truth telling, you know, and it was so important to be authentic and tell our stories, own our stories, you know, I could I could just connect with your deep burning desire to connect the dots. I think all of us who've been impacted by traumatic loss have this deep burning desire for that, I would probably say that mythical closure. Uh, whatever it is. And, you know, we try to decode. It's like trying to solve a very cryptic uh, crossword puzzle. And you know that this is not it. This is not it. I think in uh, in our Upanishads, we have this uh, beautiful line which says, neti, neti. No, it's not this. It's not this. And therefore, we try to, you know, uh, uh, piece together the missing jigsaw puzzles as we try to reconstruct our world. And when you were sharing uh, uh, your childhood experience that is something which I could really really resonate with not that I had the same experience but I could just transpose it to my loss experience and it just felt uh, the same and uh, the intergenerational pain and trauma that again was something uh, so so poignant and something which really came up to me was when uh, when we read uh, lived experience narratives or when we listen to lived experience narratives or when we invite people uh, to tell their narratives, I, I think there is an overwhelming need for people to feel that, oh, it has to be a tell all, bear all kind of thing, you know. But I think from my own experience while writing it, I, I choose to write about what I wanted to uh, put out in the public domain. And there are certain things which are very, uh, very personal, uh, deeply private. And I choose not to put it out because there is there are other people involved who are not there to maybe speak up for themselves or for us to hear their side of the story. So that's, I think, a very conscious choice making which is involved when I think we are listening to lived narratives, uh, either as a reader or as a researcher. And the whole thing about the moral relativism of truth uh, you know that something was as I was listening to you that came up uh, very well and uh, and later when you talked about uh, the right to grieve uh, I think uh, grieving is something which is I don't I, I think we most of us 
across the world, across cultures, we are moving to a very uh, a grief phobic culture. In fact, I'm extremely concerned that grief is increasingly being medicalized and uh, pathologized rather than viewing it for as a visceral, a uh, fetal response to loss. Uh, can be any kind of loss, but here very specifically we are re we are referring to the loss of a loved one or the loss of something which was uh, very very uh, important uh, to the person concerned. So this whole uh, there is this need uh, to uh, decontextualize grief and place it in a larger organic context. You know the the context of what it what it means to be a uh, human, and sometimes I'm as I said I'm very very concerned about the medicalization and pathologization of grief, where it is seen as a grief disorder. In fact, the term for that is prolonged grief disorder, which I think itself uh, gives us uh, very inappropriate lenses uh, through which to view someone who is trying to reconstruct uh, the world. And uh, uh, of course, uh, there is this whole thing of victimization, and I think that's the journey for someone who is trying to reconstruct uh, 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 their, their narrative after loss. It's, I think it's, um, it's never linear. Uh, I, I say this because it's like one step forward and 10 steps backward. And I think in most loss narratives, and this is perhaps, I think Professor Nair would be able to also maybe uh, endorse this or validate it, or maybe, you know, give us better perspectives. I find that I am talking as a writer right now who has just, just written her loss narrative. I find that in the early stages of writing the draft, uh, you know, it was, I was repeating myself, I was looping myself, mm -hmm. and I had my uncle who was actually uh, uh, holding it, the narrative for me at the other end, there were transitions which were missing between paragraphs. You know, uh, normally I'm pretty good at linking paragraphs, but I found that the writing emerged very imagistically, it would stand in discrete paragraphs, and the transitions were missing. I am saying this because I'm now looking at a print ready PDF. And for me, this sanitized, deodorized version of my narrative, uh, well, I do understand publishing conventions, but actually the real loss was lurking in those early drafts. Uh, so that for me was uh, very, very interesting. And I could sense that sense of, um, that sense of uh, something missing, you know, some central piece which is missing, uh, and uh, in in Professor Gray's uh, narrative, the voice. And I think that this is something as researchers we also need to be very uh, very careful about. Lost narratives. I think it's just not what appears on the page. Uh, it's in the subtext, you know. A lost lurks between uh, between the, uh, in the pauses between words. Uh, poetry also lurks in pauses, uh, but uh, so does uh, so does loss. And this whole thing about, I think, loss narratives, I think we need to step away from viewing them as triumph over adversity genres. It's it may look like that, but I think it's something far more than that. Uh, and I think when people read a loss narrative, it's like, oh my God, look at that person. She's you know triumphed so much. She's uh, you know, uh, done this, done that. But I think that's beside the point. It's the struggles, it's the tears. And at the same time, not wallowing in that, but realizing that uh, behind the clouds, the sun is still shining. And I think um, I, for one, would love to create a Sangha. Uh, which is a tribe of uh, uh, people uh, helping them to uh, heal themselves through uh, telling their uh, stories. Um, and I, I also wonder why uh, women are overrepresented in uh, uh, lived, uh, lived experience uh, narratives. Um, uh, you know, I don't know whether telling stories comes uh, very easily to us. And this whole thing about this journey being so um, non-linear, uh, so cyclical, you don't just get from 
point A to point B and they've and there you move on. Uh, do we really uh, move on? Uh, I think we move forward uh, through the loss. Uh, do we really uh, have that mythical sense of closure? I mean, I think this sense of closure, which again is a very overused uh, term, um, I think this closure I suppose if and when it happens, uh, needs to happen very organically. You know, it's like a gentle leaf, a leaf uh, falling down, a flower floating, a feather floating in the air. And then when the moment is right, it just lands uh, where it is. And I think that's how people who've been through a uh, been through trauma, uh, been through loss, uh, heal. Uh, there's something very organic about this process. And I'd like to conclude by saying that uh, mainstream, uh, the mainstream perspective is of, uh, uh, of uh, grieving being all in the head, you know, it's so cognitive. But I think uh, grieving trauma is embodied in every cell in the body. It's, I think the body keeps score. And I think this embodied sense of trauma uh, is I think we need to, uh, need to be uh, very, very aware of. And it's, it's the cells, it's in every cell of our body. And probably that's why we also have uh, intergenerational trauma if it is uh, not uh, if it is not processed, and lastly, this professor Professor Naya, there's a, a, a lovely comment you made. I just couldn't uh, can't help but respond to it when you talk about a language breakdown, and I think this is something so important in loss narratives because at some point there is this gap between the experience. And we are struggling for that elusive right word to capture that uh, experience. Uh, in that sense, just as there's something lost in translation, I think there is this also this paradoxical sense of loss that we are unable to uh, communicate. And I think that's uh, there is great wisdom in learning to stay uh, stay with that. So thank you, Professor Gray, for a very very beautiful sharing. It was profound, insightful, and deeply moving. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Murli. And in fact, uh, Professor Nair also said that we should uh, learn to think with pain. And Mam is also suggesting about sangha, and uh, so. <laughs> Very beautiful things. Uh, I was, we are so glad to, you know, hear to all of you and uh, learn from you. Uh, so quickly, we should go to our uh, next uh, discussant, uh, Professor Smita Kumar. We are so thankful for ma'am to uh, help us organize this event and uh, uh, <coughs> support us to holding this deliberation. Anshula, why don't you introduce uh, Professor Smita? Yes, okay. Uh, professor Smita Kumar is Assistant Professor of Human Resource Development at the School of Humanities and Social Sciences in Al Akhawain University, Morocco. She is a researcher activist engaging in research on intimate partner violence and work family spillover, researcher self care, and transformative learning in students through mindfulness. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Anshula. Um, Thank you so much for Doris. I don't know where to begin because I've had the privilege to not just read your book, but also know you personally and professionally when we shared the space in Morocco for two years. And um, it's very hard for me to really look at the whole context, knowing you personally, having the privilege and the honor to walk through your life. It almost feels like as if you welcomed me into your past through from your childhood to where you are today. And that's how reading your book was. So it's a great honor and a privilege to have done that. And um, I think there are so many things that we can probably talk about, but from a perspective of time and really um, narrowing, it, narrowing it down for this discussion, I think the first thing that comes to me is two years ago when we talked about our personal losses and the whole aspect of heuristic inquiry, because I had written a paper sometime back about my own healing journey. And it just feels so, um, it resonates so much with me because while I was reading your book, our experiences are so different. The context is so different, but what, what you talked about that we are somewhere united in our pain and in our tra trauma. 
And so that is the connection that I felt while I was reading your book and while you were sharing your perspectives today. I think I, I really liked the part where you talked about the collective healing cannot begin until the individual healing starts and we address that. So that I think is absolutely powerful. And unfortunately in a lot of cultures, I'm familiar with some of them, not a lot that you talk about, but at least a little bit from the Moroccan perspective and some from an Indian perspective. A lot of, time, a lot of times um, individual healing is not something that people are very willing to engage in, or even if there's somebody who's willing to engage, the others are forget about it, move on, forgive, forget, move on. And I think you talk about that a lot when you go through your experiences across different cultures. So it's interesting to see that cultural similarity as well, which is unfortunate, but yes. And I think Dr. Nandini also talked about grieving and how we are not allowing others to grieve or what is the process of grieving. It can be so different for anybody. Um, the other thing that really touched me is when you talk about the whole process of engaging in this research methodology, which is heuristic inquiry that you and I have common with our work. It, it, so the research method does exist. And so I think the question that I have is, when did you realize that your personal life story and questions moved into taking the shape of this heuristic inquiry and moved into the scholarly engagement? So that it would be interesting to know. The other thing that I am keen to talk about is in the academic setup, when I was embarking on my study and that was deeply motivated by my own um, perspective of surviving domestic violence, um, and, and I did my doctoral study in the US 10 years ago, I was discouraged by the academics to engage in that study because it was too personal. It was only meant for psychology. So even though the methodologies exist, a lot of time academics are not interested in supporting that kind of research. Um, I also know that several academics in our current university were very surprised when you took this topic up about ethnographic study or studies based on personal narratives. So 10 years later in a different culture, in a different context, the same narrative. My point is there are stories there are people who want to engage in this pursuit and trying to bring the personal in the scholarly context. So as an academic, as a researcher, how do you think we can promote this kind of research? We can encourage this kind of research. And also in cultures where talking about your personal narrative is such a, such a taboo. I remember when I had shared my paper almost seven, eight years ago with another person who I greatly regard She's lived most of her life in the US, but she's an Indian. Her first reaction to the paper was, why would you want to share your personal story and, and talk about it to everybody? And, and I think that is something that remains as a puzzling point, both as an individual and also as a researcher who believes in really bringing the two together. Because as we know that these research methodologies are meant for us to connect the personal in the scholarly context. Because when we do that, we bring theory and we bring practice together. We bridge the gap that academics always, almost keep complaining about that there is so much divide. So I will pause at that point right now and it would be lovely to hear your perspective and my other questions and thoughts, I will pick it up in my second round. But thank you so much for this honor and pleasure, uh, honor and privilege to walk through your past and your journey. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Professor Smita. Uh, Govind, ma'am, would you like to add anything or direct the session? Yes. I am I'm overwhelmed. And uh, I was thinking that how to go about it. Mm. So this evening has been why I'm overwhelmed. I will take about maybe four or five minutes. Uh, that this evening is really the evening of the stories and lived experiences. And that's why one is uh, overwhelming experience. I also uh, like to share that uh, in the beginning of the feminist movement in India, the one thing that women's group did when the, even the women, it was called as the autonomous movement later, but in pre-autonomous women's movement, 
the people, women got together and they talked about their lived experiences from the stories of familial rape, stories of other kind of things. And that created a lot of bonding. And as that, uh, then the, when the institutions began a gender study, these things were gone and we are still looking in search of this. So this is definitely a very good kind of process of healing or the right to grieving, whatever we can call it, sharing your experiences, which gives a lot of strength to others. That you are not only, only one, there are others who are there like you, one kind of stress or another kind of, not stress, one kind of trauma or tragedy and another kind of trauma and tragedy and how they overcame it uh, on, uh, in the process of life. Um, it is at this point then it was developed the personal as political. That is the point that we were hearing that uh, personal really cannot, we cannot separate the two spheres. That is another learning that uh, I think I have got. I'm a social scientist, so I'm talking from that point of view that how the women's movement <coughs> really learned from the, these narrations, these lived experiences that the two cannot be different. And what is the political is also personal. Uh, people's lack of trust in political regimes. This is, I think there are, uh, this is a common commonality, not only in Africa, but in most part of Asia. But uh, why women are really have, why women grieve more or why women really tend to sometime kind of shrink in their kind of state, what they are. Because the women have to deal with four institutions, not only with the state, however the well-evident state may be, which is not really, but they have to deal with these four institutions are family, community, state, and the market. And it would be very, very rare that if you find in one institution the complete support. So they turn to fall on the women's groups. So right to Sangha that was talked about, that is very, very important. If you look at the kind of self-help groups, one of the things I have learned from the self-help groups in India and also in Bangladesh, where they are called Credit Saving Society, that this is my new family. I can share everything, whatever torture or whatever beating or other kind of things that I, I face uh, in my life. That would be the... Uh, about Professor uh, Doris, that is the... Uh, when she talked about her mother, who was a feminist in her own way, but did not raise the issue when the father was not very kind to you. Professor Dor uh, Doris, I also think that uh, the women's complicity in patriarchal structures is there, patriarchal control. We should not shy away from saying that, that otherwise the, it would be uh, kind of... Uh, uh, rather relatively easy to change patriarchy. The reason that patriarchy changes its forms, one way or another, it continues and it gets modernized, and but at the same time, it remains the, it takes the shape of the torture. There is a women's complicity. And if there was no complicity and no control of mind and patriarchal uh, beliefs and patriarchal structures, things would be easy for us. That would be the one of the things that, um, Listening to you remind us also of the holocaustic conditions of uh, many individual and collective women in our societies. I don't have the time to go through it, but those I have lost a child, uh, for example, my firstborn um, uh, daughter. That time I got support from my, I was teaching in AM, IIT Bombay at that time, support from the student, just their visits. And the reason I took the kind of thing that um, I returned to teaching with them and because I did find the support when I was full-time pregnant, that time I was going there and they were helping me in all ways. And these were both male and female students, both boys and girls were there and they visited me regularly and I got a lot of support uh, from them. So it depends where do you really have this kind of support and we should draw on that. And that may differ from individual to individual, although I still stress the women's group uh, which is kind of, uh, which you find that uh, because of the similar experiences, I don't believe in the kind of um, uh, sense, essentialism of women, but because they are, have gone through this kind of experience, that's why uh, uh, you find uh, uh, that support is there. Uh, 
uh, I liked very much when you said about uh, the truth can be known in the absence of facts or data. And we fall back, there is no data on women's violence. There are no data on women's uh, ownership of land. And I mean, there is a lack of data on everything. Professor Smita, Professor Morali, we all know about this, uh, uh, that uh, those who are talking about this, but that doesn't mean that this thing doesn't exist. So the reality is something else. And then to provide with facts and to prove that, okay, prove that, that can be sometimes manipulated. There is a need for data, I'm not saying, but addressing the need, addressing the problem should not wait only when the data is there. Uh, I am a great believer. I last, my last point is I'm a great believer in individual agency. Yeah? Society consists of individuals. And, with, and this individual agency is needed in order to assert one's agency in the state, community, and family structures. So individual agency is very, very important. Individual rights are very important. And dealing with individuals in the grieving situation is also very, very important. That has been by the learning from Professor Doris. Uh, Professor uh, Rukmini, I just wanted to kind of uh, uh, a few points that I liked very much and I support kind of thing. Women's strategies are very different from men's strategies. I mean, we are really can't compare the two from disadvantaged groups to advantaged groups, okay? to privilege to non-privilege, to asset holders to non-asset holders. So why their strategies will not be different? Their, their, their strategies, their pattern of grieving, their pattern of lived experiences are bound to be different. And that's why women seek solutions in the women's groups rather than in the other groups. I also very much liked your point about that we needed a methodological shift in order to have the kind of paradigm shift. This is another important thing that is very important because um, uh, always in, uh, I mean, in social sciences, there has been an econo economist, the worst kind of thing, talking of the objectivity, that you should be detached from the subject you study. Uh, you should not talk about the personal thing. You should not even talk about women if you are a woman. Otherwise it becomes very kind of subjective analysis and subjective analysis is not the social scientists should be doing otherwise they are not kind of truthful in their dealing with the problem this has been overturned by the feminist or economist and feminist analysis for feminist social sciences also so <coughs> so admittedly we have these complexities and they are very important in dealing with this and uh, of course, I would think that uh, one thing I wanted to say that is the last point, that right to grief is important, but more you get into some kind of activity, whatever you like, whether writing, whether agriculture, cultivation, whether talking to others, whether it is a kind of playing drama, your grief gets reduced. And that also has to be seen. That does not mean that you are, you really have oh, kind uh, you have not dealt with the situation in a kind of the way that you wanted to deal with it. But this takes away your kind of grief. This is my personal kind of uh, experience that uh, sharing with you. Thank you very much. It has been really, really a tremendous learning session for me and overwhelming experience. Thank you. Arjun, I think we, there are some questions we can take and then we invite Professor Gray. Yes. <coughs> We can also have the next round, so I will call it the question. Uh, Professor Gray, why don't you go on? Yes. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, very thoughtful and significant feedback. Um, I took some notes, so hopefully I can address uh, some of the questions that some of you raised. Um, Dr. Nair talked about women preferring to tell their stories in a joint setting, in a collective setting. That has been, uh, as far as Tunisia is concerned, that has certainly been my experience, that women, um, when you have a group of victims come together, that they very freely share their stories. Um, however, I think the storytelling is only one side of the, sto one side of the coin 
the story listening is just as important. Without somebody listening, just the sheer telling doesn't really do that much. It might relieve you for the moment, but in order for significant systemic change to occur, there has to be listening. There has to be listening. Um, so I would say that telling a story is a beginning step, but somebody uh, needs to listen. You cannot, you should, it, it, ultimately it's not healing if your story is told in a void, into a void. Um, and yes, I do agree that women begin to articulate in a group, they begin to find a language. Um, and that very often, uh, you said that there's a language breakdown. When you're overwhelmed with trauma, you don't have the language. And I remember some meetings where women didn't know what to say. They just put up their shirt and showed the scars where they were beaten. They, they didn't know what else to say. But the more we, we sat in these rounds and you would ask and say, so what did it feel like when you know, the scar is a result of something? That action that caused that scar, what was that situation and how did you feel? So active listening helps the narrator find his or her language, I think, um, so that they can articulate their trauma. Um, with regards to some of what Dr. Murali said, um, telling a life story, I think what it does to the person who narrates their life story, and you talked about making meaning, by telling your story, I think it allows the one who tells his or her story to give it meaning beyond anger, beyond grief, beyond a desire for vengeance, but you begin to own your own story. And it allows you to make sense of your larger life story beyond those initial or even sustained feelings of frustration, anger, grief, vengeance, etc. However, um, telling the, a personal story, I think, does not diminish the responsibility for systemic change. Such tragedy, such trauma also don't occur in a vacuum. They are perpetrated against others or even when it's perpetrated against oneself, as in the case of suicide. There are larger circumstances that bring this about. So telling one's own story does not absolve, absolve the state or the larger unit to take action from response, taking responsibility for that situation to be caused. So I think those are two different strands. One, gaining authority and ownership over your own life story, which is some sense of empowerment, giving it meaning, but at the same time, still holding the larger system or the larger uh, authorities responsible for what happened. Um, so I think that is sometimes maybe not clearly enough emphasized. As long as you tell you the story of your trauma, everything is good. No, not everything is good. There is still ne is need for action. Um, then uh, to what uh, Smita was saying, you know, the beginning of uh, Anna Karenina, Tolstoy's uh, story, all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And I would turn it around that each unhappy family or each broken individual is so much more similar to each, uh, to every other broken family or individual. 
and that um, it is in happiness that we differ. But the pain is what I think is cross-cultural and unites people. And I was talking with Smita earlier this morning. What I find is um, really problematic when we, um, when we um, parcel out trauma as discrete entities. Here's the Holocaust that happened in Germany at a certain time. And these are the Holocaust victims. Here are the tortured women in Tunisia that happened at a particular time in, in history. That's a discrete human event. Here is what you talked about some situations in India, but they are all treated as disconnected historic or individual fates or events, which doesn't allow for victims to come together and find their strength in relating to one another. As long as victims, trauma victims, continue to be divided and say, oh, you don't understand my fate because you're Indian and I'm German and you're Tunisian. And you know, we are all so different. We don't understand each other. It doesn't allow for the tremendous strength or power to emanate that comes when people realize, boy, we, our heavy hearts are so similar. And we can therefore help lift each other up and we can jointly push for, cha for change. Um, then uh, Smita asked, uh, when, the, um, when I started making this connection between the personal and the heuristic research, at some point when I was doing my research in Tunisia and I was always encouraging the women, even pushing them, I said, you need to go to the truth commission. Hi there, the little dog. <laughs> um, you need to go to the truth commission. You need to tell your story, not just for yourself, but to correct the national narrative. You know, to collect, co correct how history is taught in schools. Your story is a very important ingredient, how history, the history of your country is to told. And then, you know, I, I came up against this hesitancy. I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to reveal this. And I kept pushing and pushing. And then so at one point I sat at home and typing up my notes and I realized I'm asking these women to do something, to give something that I myself am not willing to give. I'm asking them to come forward with a story that I myself am not willing to tell. I reserve the right to privacy for myself while at the same time encouraging others to break their silence. And then I thought, this is really dishonest. I need to, I cannot ask somebody else to give something that I myself am not willing to give. Um, and so I think Smita, in answer to your question, that's when I made the connection that I need to, if you will, set an example saying, I'm not ashamed to tell my story. Therefore, I feel very much, I can ask you to also not do that uh, for, or encourage you to come forward with your story as well. I'm not tr trying to hide while at the same time asking you to be frank. And so I thought just for scholarly integrity, to maintain my own scholarly integrity, I thought I needed to take that step. Um, it, it doesn't have to be in a book. It doesn't have to be in a publication. But you just need to realize you need to do what you're asking your subjects to do. You cannot ask somebody else to do more than you are yourself willing to do. And as researchers, because we are so sophisticated, and we are professors, and we are interviewing maybe illiterate women, no, we need to really break down that barrier at a human level. Um, <clears throat> yes, the personal is political, of course. <laughs> the personal is political, and I would take it a step further. The personal is also scholarly. 
the person who is also at the root of our scholarly inquiry. And as I said at the very beginning, you know, Chancellor Merkel said she became a physicist because of her personal history, right? So even when you go into the hard science, there is a life story that makes you go into a certain field. Um, you did say that women grieve more. I don't know if, I'm not sure. I think maybe men and women grieve differently, but I'm not exactly sure if one grieves more than the other. Maybe they express it differently or what certainly prolongs grief if it's not listened to. And that may be more often the case with women than men, that their grievances are diminished because women are, you know, we have all these female at, uh, attributes that we are patient and, and, and humble and enduring and kind. And so enduring another grievance is just one of those female attributes that gets put on top of all of that. Um, to those perceived female characteristics. Um, and then you mentioned also about women's complicity in patriarchal structure. This is of course very, very true. But in my own personal uh, 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 background, I would say it's, it's a little bit different. My dad was an ardent feminist. He was pushing my sister and me to become independent. And always from when we were little, he said, don't ever become dependent on anyone, especially not a man, you must be independent. Um, my mother's silence was, I think, more that she wanted to leave it to my father to talk or not talk about his, his situation. She did not want to take that over from him. And she understood why he was doing what he was doing, you know, trying to equip us for another emergency or calamity. And she agreed that survival training might be necessary at some point or would come in handy. So she allowed him the dominance over his, uh, or the power over his truth or his secret to keep it a secret. I'm not saying I agree or I disagree, but I don't think it was um, acquiescence to a patriarchic situation. Um, it was more respecting his need at that time to not come forward. And I think that's a very difficult balance. I wish my mother would have intervened. I wish she would have encouraged my father to tell us. Um, but for whatever reason, she felt that it was for him to do and that she needed to or wanted to completely leave that up to him. Um, yes, so the last thing I wanted to say is that uh, going back to uh, what Dr. Morali said, the loss lurks in pauses. And it goes back to what I said earlier. I think telling a story and listening a story are both equally important. And especially as scholars, we are sometimes very focused on our catalog of questions and we don't listen to what is maybe said or wants to be said beyond what we are asking. And the real stories are probably in what we are not even asking. So to be so attentive a listener to let the person that we are talking to determine what emerges as the important topic and not come with a predetermined catalog of what it is we want to find out because the more important thing is what does this person perceive as an important point? And are we willing to pick that up? So listening and, and, uh, store, listening and uh, telling, I think are very, very closely connected and very important skills for us as uh, scholars to learn. Yeah, I, I hope I did answer some of your questions, but maybe I didn't answer all. Certainly, I didn't answer all. Yes, yes. So, so thank you, ma'am. So, yes, uh, Professor Rukmani, yes, why don't you go on? So, I just wanted to make four brief points, and there are more questions. Uh, 
than points. The first one consists in asking about the nature of listening. We must listen. And that is actually in our research, and I have written books and narrative and researched the area now with my PhD students. Uh, what we found is that there is a six part structure which begins with which could begin with some orientation, a crisis, resolution, etc. Forget the structural parts, but what we found is that in any spontaneous narrative, all spontaneous narratives are actually embedded in dialogue. So narrative is a dialogic form which builds in listening and uh, three of the major parts of narrative such as evaluation and resolution and coda, which is handing the narrative back to the present, all are done by listeners. So empirical evidence is very strong that listening is built into the structure of narrative, but what might have happened and has happened is that listening has been suppressed as an active uh, um, as an act, as a form of active participation, but our research has overwhelmingly found that listening is so uh, so essential to narrative that it's almost uh, as if uh, you can't imagine a narrative in except in the form of a telling. So I would like to make that point because there's a lot of research. Um, support for it. The second uh, point I would like to make concerns this distinction between lived experience and other types of experience. Now we know that all our experiences are lived, that they're embodied, uh, and that they are part of the imagination. But what we are not sure about is how uh, invalid is imaginative experience. Is that so, you know, we learn as much, and this was my point about literature. We learn as much from other people's narratives and reimagining ourselves in the light of others' speech. So I don't think that a distinction can clearly be made, and this is a theoretical question, between lived experience and imaginative experience which involves memory and ghosting and all sorts of things. So these two come together, particularly when affect is involved, like grief, shame, hurt, et cetera. So uh, I want to, uh, I mean, raise a series of questions about the borderline between what people have been calling lived experience, which is basically oral narratives and other kinds of, uh, self-imaginings which are not um, uh, necessarily lived but are imagined that I think that imagined world is equally important so that's the second uh, point I want to make the first was about listening and how it's endemic to narrative um, so narratives typically do not fall into a void, although we may have to train ourselves to be better listeners, but listeners interventions are very common in narrative. So that is the first point. Second is the division between lived experience and imaginative experience involving memory and so on. We know that those are not clear or hard divisions, mm -hmm. just as telling and listening are not. The third point I want to make is we have assumed throughout this lecture and our discussions that healing is a good goal, that we must heal. And I really want to understand whether people who are in wounded, and in the middle of their experience, because as Wittgenstein said, there is no such thing as momentary grief. You carry it with you all your life and it transmutes and changes. So do we want to privilege healing totally or do we want to also say that those who are wounded and they 
continue to be wounded throughout a lifetime so that they shroud themselves in secrecy and uh, all sorts of avoidance. Uh, they don't want to take an additional burden of pain. We assume that healing is always the best condition. That's my third point. And my fourth point is to do with my own research on Darwin, who also talked about you know, the origins of our myths. And we have looked at, I think Darwin sent a questionnaire on six in the expression of the emotions in man and animals, which is what the text that I've been working about. He sent this questionnaire to many countries, including India and North Africa. And uh, he was asking, how is grief embodied and expressed in your culture? How is surprise expressed? Does your mouth go open? Does your, do your eyes go wide? And so in some ways, these we have replicated these, we have made films on grief, on shame, on all these emotions. The point is about how we learn from these tapes, how we share them. And that involves a kind of ethics of doing research, a methodology of doing research, which we haven't found. We can't put them on YouTube. We can't, although we have got written permission and informed consent to do so because these stories are so personal. So the decision to put things out what is meant by informed consent? How we get together and build sanghas and so on, uh, uh, when people may or may not want to, to engage in confessional narratives. These are all things that I think are unanswered questions in qualitative research. And so I, I think uh, Dor uh, Doris Gray's um, own research and her own telling of her story has uh, provoked a lot of questions which in my mind, which I have been thinking about for a long time, but for which I do not have the answers. Is silence always a bad alternative? Is secrecy always a dreadful thing? Or is it part of the survival mechanisms as Darwin said? which are built into us. So these are, for me, open questions which we will have to think about. That's, uh, that's what I wanted to say about these distinctions that we've used. Thanks. Could I answer? Yes, yes sure. please, please go on. Yeah, okay. Um, I, what, you, what you just said is all so, so important. And I think there is a connection between the imagined and the life experience. In the process of telling your life experience, you begin to imagine mm -hmm. a new life that is to come. So I think there is a very close relationship with telling the trauma as a basis for imagining a life beyond the trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and as to is healing a good thing, I've, I've really thought about this a lot, actually. Um, healing does not mean that you're over anything. You know, when you have uh, like a gash, when it's healed, you have a huge scar. So that scar is an eternal testimony to what happened. And our spirit or our soul is the same. It may have healed, but it bears these huge scars that are invisible to most others who don't care to look closely enough, but those scars are there. So healing does not mean to get rid of the past. Yeah, I understand. But that. how to incorporate the past into a new, new future. And I do think it is important to go beyond the pain. And by that, I mean to not make a painful event or a series of painful events, the single most important events in your life. By telling your story or by healing, what I mean, what I mean by healing is that you create an openness for new experiences. And that means you have to walk through that pain 
and then create a new way to move forward with that pain, but allowing for new experience to enter your life. Otherwise, I feel you, be, you can become trapped in identifying yourself singularly with that pain. And then you stay in that loop of pain and that is all you are. Healing to me means that that pain is one important aspect of who you are, but it is not all that you are. Hold on, Doris. Supposing I have never experienced, uh, except for very small trauma and grief, I have never experienced the kind of deep trauma which you experienced, or Tunisian women and so many women. But you, uh, the unscarred person and the scarred person, what is the nature of the dialogue between them? And how does telling and listening uh, heal that I, I mean I really want to know this is not a set of challenges this is a set of trying to understand what you are also trying to understand and you meet many people who I have been told equally the equal number of people I've met who have been extremely damaged by that one experience. There have been women who say, I love my parents, I've had this wonderful life, my husband is so good, etc. And I just can't understand this trapped in grief experience. What are our resources to methodological, research-wise, as human beings? Uh, what are our resources to handle this difference between scarring and the dissolved scar, which hasn't gone, and the person who feels that they are not scarred. And humility. That's humility. humility. Okay, so that's one way to think about it. To uh, recognize but, that that other life experience is beyond my capacity, but I'm willing to walk a little bit with you and listen to your life and walk with you through some of that pain. Even if you've never experienced anything bad, you can say, I will walk with you if you let me. But and supposing you humble... choose not yeah. to. Hmm? Supposing you choose not to. Supposing I say, look, I'm happy. I don't want to war. So don't you think that the state, the educational system, all these things have to be educated into teaching how you walk with the other? Of course. And that we are not invested in that. I mean, I don't want this to be just a two-way conversation. No, 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 so no. Um, maybe stopping. others need to. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> very, very nice. Professor Govind, would you like to come in and we also then go to uh, Dr. Nandini and Professor Smita. Yes, ma'am. I'm fine. I, I think uh, uh, I have only additional two points to share that uh, systemic change is needed at the individual and collective level. That is very important because uh, it is not really individual only, but individuals uh, that make this kind of system. So systemic change is needed, which has come out very well and also that. Um, uh, and the second important thing is that storytelling is to be followed by actions and mm -hmm. the kind of dealing with these holocaustic conditions in which poor and women are concentrated. That also would be important kind of thing because uh, uh, there is a strong kind of uh, 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 school of feminist analysis, which I also belong to, that uh, while the experiences are universal and common, but uh, Dalit women in India would feel more kind of holocaustic conditions than non-Dalits. That would be the... So there are kind of these differential kind of aspects that also need to be recognized within this commonality. These are the two things that I wanted to share and I wanted to... I have learned about that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Dr. Nandan, please. Yes. Uh, Professor Gray, uh, once again, I'm experiencing a deep resonance with whatever you've shared. So I'm not coming up with anything new, but just, you know, uh, 
reflecting back i guess uh, the act of telling our stories is transgressive uh, it's also disruptive and that's a conscious choice uh, as tellers one makes you know uh, i want to tell my story because i want to tell my story and i really don't think there is any uh, sense of privileging in that and i also completely agree with your views on healing yes uh, the pain uh, one needs to be careful that the pain doesn't become the grand narrative of our lives it doesn't uh, define us it doesn't restrict us it doesn't reduce us it's it's perhaps an important part of who we are it has shaped us and you know uh, it's it's propelled us on probably paths we would have never walked uh but yes and i think this whole uh, journey of healing is 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 a very conscious walk you know i think one needs to be extremely self aware and uh, yes and i think that's the journey that's the process thank you process smita why don't you yeah thank you dr arjun uh, yeah i couldn't very interesting discussion i couldn't agree more with uh, our speaker and also uh, some other comments that we've had um i also want to begin by saying that um whether it was my personal journey of healing through research or whether i'm talking about dr Gord, doris grace journey um it's not privileging healing healing is a very personal journey it is the individual that decides when and how they want to go through the journey so it, it is nobody else's position because then you sabotage that process and that is not yours to do it so you have to let people go through what they want to my only point was when people engage in that process and if there are others who are around them if you can be humble around if you don't understand but if you do and if you can walk with them like dr doris said just walk but it can be painful for you as well so you can choose not to engage in that at all and that is also absolutely right because i know there are so many of my colleagues and friends here who have known doris for last 20 years that she's lived here they they've known her story more personally than through a book and they are scared to read her book and and that's the conversation i had with one of my colleagues few days ago where i said hey take your time when you're ready to read that book because it is a very very powerful narrative and it can touch you in ways that if you're not ready it will not be good and you don't know whether you're supported to cope with that so it is absolutely a personal journey and not to uh, privilege one or the other coming back to your point um, uh, your uh, presentation and also the book i think there is one thought that comes to me uh, very strongly is when you talk about multi generational trauma you know the the pain of trauma is multi generational that you talk about i think to me it resonates a lot from many perspectives whether as an individual as a child as a daughter or whatever or whether as a survival of survivor of violence or whether you're talking about in a larger narrative from a state state perspective so i i when i was reading i couldn't help but connect with um the partition that india and pakistan partition that happened that i don't know the trauma that people went through and how that was impacting other generations it was three gener two generations before me so i don't know what happened i wasn't close enough to that but i'm sure it was deeply disturbing for people who couldn't share those narratives with their own children and then what happened to those relationships and thereafter and something similar happens when there is intergenerational abuse that happens that you see your grandmother go through abusive relationship you see your mother go through that and then you are caught in that so it's a it's a cycle of abuse that you caught in and so that is another dimension that's coming to my mind but i will just end by just asking you one question and it's absolutely fine if you decide to answer or not because it may touch personal perspectives that um when you're talking about that parents in their own victimhood they inflict pain on their children so my question is do you think that can ever change and you because i know you're a mother as a mother how did that connect to your own story and thank you so much once again 
uh, yes, Prasad, great. Uh, we also have some questions which have come on Zoom and also Facebook Live. Uh, Simi have collected all those. Simi, why don't you go? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Gray. Uh, and uh, to all distinguished panelists, um, this has been so powerful, so illuminating, passionate, and intellectually stimulating session. Um, it is actually evident from uh, the number of questions and comments that are coming up on Facebook Live as well as here on Zoom. Uh, I would just put them to you uh, briefly in a moment. Uh, so, um, uh, one question is uh, if you could uh, in your you could take your time and you could also suggest some references uh, to go through some books uh, one of our uh, or members of the uh, audience has asked for it requested for it um, uh, another question is that um, you know uh, speaking about or sharing about uh, one's trauma and lived experiences uh, either break break uh, a person or uh, um, make the person better and come out stronger. Uh, so uh, do you think those who are not well read, you know, uh, not really literate, are able to express themselves? Uh, does, um, does this come as a restriction uh, to them, to such people? And who is it to whom they can share? It, whether it is uh, people who are well read or otherwise do pe do do the other people really have time to engage with the people who are traumatized relatives um, as we see especially in india they do not necessarily come to the rescue of the people who are uh, traumatized they rather are ridiculed so this, so this further adds to the uh, salt on the hurt. What is your recommendation that all people uh, who are suffering are able to express themselves and ultimately find peace? Uh, second question is um, that why is it just the women uh, more coming out and speaking about it? Uh, is this a patriarchal mindset again? Uh, men are considered to be mentally strong and they are able to move forward. But, um, and then on the other hand, if women are considered to be emotional and hence they, they need more time, etc. Uh, this further adds to the pressure on the men. I think um, this, uh, the question is, I think this again aligns themselves to such thinking, even if they would uh, want to. Then we have another point of view from a male uh, co colleague uh, in the audience who said that, uh, you know, men equally suffer and uh, they suffer from depression as well as heart attacks. So uh, uh, in fact, this kind, kind of, it sidelines um, the women grieving more, the whole idea and the fact as not being supported by research evidence. So all this ethnography, all this anthropological studies and lived experiences, sharing of stories, et cetera, these are again being sidelined as being something uh, maybe it is coming out of a patriarchal mindset. So uh, if you could, if you could respond to uh, this and uh, a few more question uh, comments rather. Uh, well, some of them have actually mentioned that uh, we can win this battle together, and uh, we need to be more, uh, you know, uh, accommodative in terms of accommodative, sensitive, and also uh, make we should not make uh, judgments or assumptions about other people's sufferings. Uh, then uh, there is a comment on uh, by Ms. Kadja Zwan Elliott, uh, who, who seconds your point about the need to connect to, to the diverse stories from different parts of the world. She finds it's, it very powerful. And she is saying that I'm in the area in the area studies and struggle against the discourses which try to individualize the region in the MENA region, the North Africa and Mid Middle East, as if nothing has happened here, as if the injustices that people suffer from here cannot be felt or suffered in other parts of the world. And lastly, it, it is, uh, should there be classes or healing sessions or therapies for, um, uh, helping people move out of their traumatic experiences. But what uh, sh is it ethical to monetize on people's griefs? And then uh, what if the other person who is suffering does not want to uh, express themselves? Um, meaning to say that it can, 
it, it can showcase that uh, she or he is wanting to seek sympathy and that is what is holding her or him back from expressing so uh, these are some comments and questions if you could choose to answer or respond thank you okay so um maybe i get to smita's last since um I'd like to answer the, the questions from the students, if that is okay. Sure. Um, so as with regards to the references, I can send them to Professor Kumar uh, at IMPRI and then he can maybe disseminate that would be it. Great. Yes, that so I'll send him a list of references. We About people who- Event page yeah? as well. We will put in your event page as well. So that okay. it's easily available. Yes, sure. Good, so I'll do that. Um, <laughs> about uh, less literate people. Um, I would definitely make a distinction between being formally educated and being educated. And you can be very well educated without being literate. So literate just means you have formal education, but you can have education many, many other ways, which means people have a right to express themselves whichever way they want to express themselves. We are scholars, so we like to write and we like to talk, but somebody else may want to dance or may want to cry or may want to create art or may want to sing or may want to express mourning in a different way. So it goes back to what I said originally about listening. You need to let or we need to be humble enough to allow the person who wants to express their trauma, whichever way they want to express that. And then be open to the challenge is on the listener then to interpret it. If somebody dances or sings or recites a Quranic verse, we need to train ourselves to understand what is this per person trying to express that is in a form that I'm not used to. Um, so I, I do not at all think that literacy is a requirement for expressing trauma at all. Um, the, the challenge is on the person listening, not on the person expressing themselves. Um, the question was about if you don't have time to engage with what somebody may have to chair share. You make time for what you think is important. You don't forget to eat. You don't forget to brush your teeth. You make time for what you think is important. So if the other person's grievance is important, you will make time for it. To say, I don't have time to listen, is the lamest, is really the lamest excuse you can give. You make time for what you consider important. Um, the fact that you, some people say, I don't have time to listen to, to you, means what you have to say is not important. It's not a matter of time. The statement really is what you have to express is not important. Um, the issue about women, that women express grief more, da 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 da. Um, we, we had that earlier on. I'd like to just give you an example from my research in Tunisia. Women were raped and men were raped. Men who were raped talk about it. Women who were raped don't talk about it. Why? Because when a man is raped, the shame is on the abuser. The shame is on the rapist. The shame is on the criminal who perpetrated it. When a woman is raped, the shame is on her. The dishonor is on her, not on the rapist. This is very broadly speaking and very in broad uh, uh, brush strokes. But the Tunisian men that I interviewed who were raped talked about it. No problem. They talked about it. Because it was clearly understood that a crime was committed on them. So the reason why women hesitate to come forward is because of that added aspect of guilt. And when somebody says women talk more, maybe it takes them longer to get to that point. A man will get up and say, I was raped and that was terrible. And that guy should burn in hell and should be in prison, the one who did that to me. It takes a woman a lot longer to come to that place because 
internalizing the guilt or the shame for rape is so deep, so deeply inculcated that it takes you a lot longer to come forward with that story. I, I hope I addressed that a little bit. So of course, men and women suffer equally, which is why I started with the story of my father who was a man, precisely because I would like to emphasize the point that trauma is universal. It transcends gender, it transcends history, it transcends religion, culture, political system. That's precisely why I started with this story. I could have told stories from my own life that are more gendered, but I wanted to make a connection between the trauma that a man, my father experienced, and the trauma of a woman in another, in Tunisia, you know, 70 years later, continent apart, a culture apart, and that it, the response is similar, the suffering is similar, what they pass on to their children, and that gets back to Smita's question, they both pass that trauma on to their children, whether it's my father in Germany or a contemporary woman in Tunisia. Um, so about healing sessions, um, many universities, and I know Smita Kumar started classes at Al Hawain in mindfulness. And I think mindfulness classes are maybe one step, one piece in the puzzle to healing. It doesn't offer a comprehensive healing concept, but it does provide one piece in the puzzle that would compose a healing process. So some, excuse me, some universities are well on their way of offering classes that also address uh, more personal issues. And then the last question was, what if somebody doesn't want to express themselves because they fear um, that they're looking for sympathy? Hell yes, they're looking for sympathy. And so they should. <laughs> you know, we are all human beings. Yes, we have to be empathetic to one another. Mm -hmm. If we have nothing else to offer, we can offer empathy. So um, to be afraid that you're wanting to uh, engender sympathy in the other person, that's exactly what you should engender in the other person. Draw them out of themselves and offer the empathy that they are capable of. You know, it is enriching for a person who hasn't suffered to learn to enlarge their capacity for empathy by in embracing a person who has suffered. And we as human beings are, I've, I believe very strongly, we are capable of reaching out to one another across these different divides. And then lastly, um, I think parents will always pass on the good, the bad, and the ugly to their children. Um, and when my daughters read the book, they said, oh, mom, you are your father's daughter. <laughs> I didn't beat my children or anything, but I also kind of was somewhat pushy. And I, I certainly got that from my father. Um, so at some point as a parent, I think I go back to the theme of humility. You just have to accept that you made a lot of mistakes in raising your children. You tried the best you could. You loved your children the best you knew how, but it certainly always falls short. And hopefully your children will be able to forgive you for, for the things that you did wrong. That I think is the list. Yes, yes, thank you. So much, uh, Professor Gray. So we are well over at, at two hours, and uh, I think we can go for 30 seconds, one minute to each of our panelists, and then also uh, finally our uh, speaker and chair for the session to conclude uh, very briefly. Then I can uh, briefly uh, propose a vote of thanks. So uh, uh, let me start with uh, Professor Rukmani, ma'am. Yes. So we are winding down. I just have one question, which is for Professor Gray. And the question is, is a linguistic one. It says, leaving the shadow of pain. That's the title of her book. So is it the shadow that you're leaving, but not the pain? Or is it that you're leaving 
the pain, because you know the pain is something, as you said, which may be with you, but it casts a shadow which will not allow for hope. So I was wondering whether you chose that title, like leaving, not leaving pain behind, but leaving the shadow of pain. And I was wondering about the status of this notion of traumatic events casting a shadow which one might step beyond. So that's just a question to you. Uh, Thank you so much, Professor Rukmani. Dr. Nandini, would you like to share some concluding thoughts? Yes. Yeah, I am also uh, reminded that trauma need not always be disempowering. Uh, it also holds uh, uh, the power of possibilities. And I think that depends on the person uh, and that on the person experiencing it, whether you uh, turn it into uh, something which holds you back or whether it helps you to uh, go forward. Thank, thank you so much, Nandina. Uh, uh, Professor Smita, please. Yeah, I think um, I just want to say thank you. This was just very, very moving and very powerful. And I just hope that it is only a beginning in that direction that um, we allow people to do this kind of work and we support and we engage. And I remember um, Doris was asking me, how would the audience in India respond to something like this, you know? And I was like, they would be extremely engaged and they'd be really delighted that somebody is doing work like this. So thank you so much for Doris, what you did. Um, it, it just is very powerful. Thank you. And thank you to everybody for such interesting insights. I learned a lot. Thank you so much, Professor Kumar. Really, that is why I, I really thought and uh, uh, thankful to Professor Rukmani also to contribute to this so much thought-provoking and uh, a good discussion. Uh, uh, Govinda, would you like to add and conclude? And, uh, yes. I have said earlier in our uh, uh, in my conclusion, but one question that, uh, that keeps uh, in my mind and I would explore further. Why do we do what we do? Mm -hmm. I mean, with you, Professor you, uh, Gray, you started with that. And uh, that is, if we really ask this question, then there is there is a lot. And I wish we could learn a lot more from the Asia, the rural women, and uh, be both in terms of grieving and also how they deal with the trauma, because their traumas are quite, quite massive kind of thing. And their agency is also very powerful. So that is what uh, may be very good in our future uh, endeavor. And it has been a wonderful session very overwhelming and very different from other sessions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Professor Gray, would you like to have some, yes, concluding thought on uh, your lecture, that key away points, yes. Okay, to, to the question about the title of the book. Yes. I think time does not heal all wounds. Time heals very few wounds. But what we can do is escape or find a way out of the shadow this pain casts on the wounds. The pain itself will not go away, but the shadow that this pain casts, that we can find a way out from under. So that's why I chose this title. I, the pain does not go away. The trauma does not go away. The wounds will heal, but they will always be painful, always be painful. But you can find light again once you find a way from under that shadow that that pain casts over your life. Thank you. Thank you also, ma'am. Thank you, everybody. Concluding and the way for, thank you so much. And uh, 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 Professor Rukmani also have many exciting works uh, coming up and we have also planned this year, uh, many events on this theme. And uh, we would really love also to have all the panelists and also uh, Professor Gray, your contribution toward all of the exciting work uh, and but let me also officially propose a, a vote of thanks for this very excellent uh, session uh, uh, for this special lecture, the leaving the shadow of pain responses to trauma healing amid the COVID-19 pandemic uh, given by uh, Professor Doris Gray and chaired also by uh, Professor Govind Kelkar 
and uh, our uh, very distinguished panelists, including uh, Professor Rukmani from IIT Delhi Emeritus Professor and uh, Professor Smita Kumar. Uh, of course, thank you so much for uh, really introducing us to Professor Doris Gray and helping us so much to have this very serious and uh, a good deliberation. Uh, we as an impact and policy, this our work really does not you know, dwell into such things and we are so lucky to have you and also uh, Dr. Nandini to add to this deliberation. And I cannot thank you enough. We have uh, three very distinguished uh, uh, emeritus professor, Professor Govind Kilkar, our, our chair, Professor Doris Gray, Professor Rukmani, and also all the distinguished panelists. This has been really a delight for uh, Gender Impact Studies Center at, uh, at IMPRI. And uh, uh, the last year really has been the pandemic year all for all the humanity across the world. And this year we are with also the onset of vaccine, we are also looking at a revival and the, the road to recovery, be it economic, social, emotional, uh, also I would say political is, is very tough, uh, but the key message uh, is really that together we can overcome and India also being a land of faith and knowledge, we really see through this deliberation in this, uh, this year that uh, we can lead through knowledge and learning from all of you very distinguished uh, panelists. And uh, we look forward to uh, having learning more from uh, all of you, uh, your expertise and uh, invite you all to contribute to such a meaningful and impactful deliberation. And uh, we look forward to having all of you uh, uh, for a more focused and also more uh, assertive uh, in, in this very uh, fruitful deliberation to have our thing. So once again, I thank all of the panelists uh, to be a part of uh, uh, this very important special lecture by Professor Doris Gray. And uh, we wish you from all our team members, uh, Happy New Year and uh, good evening. <laughs> we all must be also very tired and India almost suffer time. Yes, thank you so much. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Professor Doris. <laughs> and take care.